More on that later. So, this kingdom is breaking in, so change your mind, change your heart, and basically believe in the good news. Don't just, don't just believe it, believe in it. You know, again, something happens, somebody comes up to explain the situation, and you say, I believe you. Okay, I get credence that I accept what you say is true. But if you say, I believe in you, that's more. I'm willing to put myself behind you. I'm making a commitment to you. And so this isn't simply believe the good news, but believe in the good news. Let it affect you. Be committed to it. And so the good news of God's kingdom breaking in. And what is that good news? That's what unfolds, unfolds throughout the rest of the gospel. In Jesus' preaching, in Jesus' miracles, in Jesus' calling disciples, etc. And so in Greek, it's pistuata en to evangelio, in the good news. Believe in, basically. Be committed to the gospel. All right, jumping ahead. We can't have this and look at every text in the gospel of Mark. We're just looking at some ones that are rather interesting. This cure the paralytic, the text where Jesus is preaching in a house. The people, the people with this paralytic can't get in, so they go around, go up on top, they take off the roof, drop the paralytic down. And I can imagine those people listening to Jesus as the paralytic comes dropping down. You know, if somebody came through the roof, well, Father Trump would have a real problem because he's in a hole in his roof. But uh, we'd all be wondering what's going on. Well, of course, roofs in those days weren't like they are today. They were uh, straw, etc., so you could easily take them apart and drop somebody in. But basically, the paralytic is let down through the roof. And Jesus says, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now, this is something totally new about Jesus in the context of things. Because technically, Jesus can forgive sins because he's God, but they don't know that. And so they question, who is he? You know? Who is he? They murmur, the scribes, you know, who is this that he can forgive sins? It's blasphemy. He's doing something that belongs only to God. He's taking on himself something that belongs to God. Well, from what we've learned so far in the gospel, if he's Messiah and son of God in the real sense, then he's God. Therefore, he can do what God does. But they don't know that. We do. And they say then, who can forgive sins except the one God? Amen. Ace Papa Os. Now, I'm very particular. If you uh, were to open a Bible and uh, look up this verse, you would see the translation, who can forgive sins except God alone? Well, I don't like that translation. There's a perfectly good Greek word for alone, and if they wanted to use it, they would. I translate it this way for a very particular reason. The Greek says, Ame, except the one, Hes, Hothamos, God. Hes is a numeral. It's the numeral one. And so, in a certain sense, using that language, Mark is again saying that Jesus is God, God is God, and God is one. And that became the question that the early church had to hammer out. How can 1 plus 1 equal 1? It's Trinitarian mathematics, <laughs> overall. But it took nearly three to four centuries and a lot of Greek words to get it to be understood. How do we understand? Well, now I'll move into another area for half a second. It's all contained in that very unusual word that everybody said, why do we have to say this in the Greek? Consubstantial. <laughs> Jesus and the Father are consubstantial. What does that mean? It means one plus one equals one. Trust me. <laughs> okay. So Jesus then responds to this, who can forgive sins except the one God, by saying, well, okay. Which is easier? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, 
or arise, pick up your pallet, and walk. Well, some people would say, well, you know, we don't. The problem is, he can say your sins are forgiven. How do they know? He says, arise, take up your pallet, and walk, and he's either going to do it or he's not. So which is easier? It's a kind of a rhetorical question. But then he says, okay, but that you might know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins as a proof that the sins are forgiven, I say to you, arise, take up your pallet, and walk. So the thing that they can visibly see becomes a sign of the thing that they cannot see. And so, you know, there, there's how I can forgive sins. Now, a couple of things. Son of man and exousia. Let me take exousia first. Authority. And this is another one that I find very interesting. And, and, and those of you who proclaim the word, whether it, whether it be ordained or not ordained, think of this in terms of authority. Ex usia in Greek. Usia is being. Ex is out of. And so we proclaim from our being. We don't read words on a page. <coughs> we read words that have become a part of us. We've wrestled with those words. We've let those words affect us. And when we have done that, and we then proclaim, we proclaim from within our being, and it becomes authoritative. You can tell when somebody is really proclaiming the word and when they're merely reading the word. You can tell when a person is merely parroting a homily and when a person is really preaching. There's an authority there. It's exousia. It's from their being. You've got to really wrestle with the text. Okay? Now, please, readers, don't all resign. <laughs> because I'm making it harder. <laughs> The other term is son of man. Now this one, everybody says, well, that simply means he's a human being. Well, that's what it did mean. In Hebrew senses, especially in Ezekiel, son of man, basically ben adam, as it is in Hebrew, meant human being. So if you read, when, when God addresses Ezekiel, he's a son of man. Now, son of man, can these bones live? Or son of man this, or son of man that. It's really, okay, human being, you know, what is this? That's the original sense from Ezekiel. Daniel, however, carries it and makes it what we call apocalyptic. And in <clears throat> writing like Daniel and the book of Revelation, etc., one level of being is represented by the level of being below it. So divine beings are human, human beings are animals, animals are etc. So, you know, we get the story in Daniel where four beasts come up out of the sea, a lion, uh, a leopard, etc. They're different countries, they're different human groups. So humans are represented by animals. In Daniel also, I looked up and I saw one like a son of man sitting on the throne. That's a divine being. One like a human being sitting on the throne. And to him was given, was presented, and so on. Power, authority, etc. So he's the one who comes to the throne of God and is presented with power, authority, dominion, etc. as a divine being. And finally, <clears throat> the book of Enoch, which did not make the Bible, but is <clears throat> and was exerting uh, influence in the time of Christ and later, the Son of Man and the similitudes of Enoch becomes a divine, eschatological, final days judgment figure who will come to be the judge. And so, what's ironic is as you enter the gospel, the term Son of God is human, the term Son of Man is divine. But as you leave the gospel, the term Son of God is divine, and the Son of Man is still divine. Jesus 
prefers the title Son of Man. And so when you see Son of Man, many times it's an, a, a certain location for I. So in the text, so that you may know the Son of Man has authority, so that you may know I have authority, I say unto you. Later on in the Passion Predictions, the Son of Man will go to Jerusalem and will suffer at the hands of the Pharisees. I will go to Jerusalem and suffer. Now you see, notice, if Jesus prefers the Son of Man title, that's a divine title. And so he prefers to be seen as a divine person. Interestingly. Okay. Now Mark's, <coughs> Mark's usage of it, as I said, is the faith of self-designation. And it designates Jesus also as suffering for the people and uh, etc. Okay, let's jump to chapter 6. This is one that I really like. The crowds. Now, Jesus has been preaching, he's been healing, he's told parables, etc. And crowds are following him all over the place. They're following him so much he wants some time to rest. And so he goes off to be by himself, and the crowds follow, and he gets to the place by himself, looks up, and he sees a vast crowd. His heart was moved with pity. Remember I said we'll find out where the emotions went. The emotions moved with pity. Esplantiste. Esplantizo line, my favorite Greek verb refers to the splankna. The splankna are the guts. And the guts are where the emotions lie. Gut-wrenching emotion. So he was moved with pity. Okay, that sounds nice. Oh, there's a big crowd out there. Isn't that nice? Oh, I wonder if they have something to eat. No, not quite what's going on here. It's a, it's a gut-wrenching emotion, basically. He was moved. Why? They were sheep without a shepherd. Now, one of the things we Bible types are taught to do is to line up the texts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke in parallel columns and look at what's the same and what's not the same. If some of you have been here from the Scripture School, I, I hear, I've met some of you who we have dealt with in the Scripture School. Uh, when you do the Synoptic Gospels, you do that, that exercise there. And, uh, I did it for the Gospel of Mark. And one of the things when I did that for this text is I discovered a few things. One of the things was this line, they were like sheep without a shepherd, is missing from Matthew and Luke in their parables. Only Mark has it. And of course, immediately when something like that happens, boom, certain antennae go up. And uh, I thought, why? Why is that? Well, we looked at it and saw, so let's go forward. So he taught them. So he, you know, fed them in a certain sense and, um, with words and teaching. It becomes late. And the disciples suggest dismissing the people. Let them go. Let them go to the towns and buy food. And Jesus says, no, you give them food. We don't have any food. All we have are five loaves and two fish. You know, should we go buy food? 200 days wages wouldn't feed this crowd. How many loaves do you have, he says. We have five loaves and two fish. Okay, wonderful. Now, he orders that they sit down on the green grass. Hmm. Once again, if we line up the text of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, only Mark has the word green. Now, that fascinating. Why did Mark have green? Well, Father, grass is green. What the heck? Anyone want to speculate why Mark might have had green? Who also forgot, who also was the only one who had the text about them being like sheep without, what, sheep without a shepherd? Ah, lights are going on. What, what light is going on? Oh, the sheep eat the grass. Okay. That is true. Yes. The what? The grass is a pasture, right? Think of your Old Testament. A good shepherd is New Testament. But you're close. Psalm 23. 
Our scripture scholar over here. <laughs> Very good, very good. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. And later on, he made them lie down on green pastures, green grass. So Mark, in specifying they were like sheep without a shepherd, then says the Lord, Jesus, is their shepherd. He is going to make them lie down on green pasture and he's going to set the table before them and feed them. And he is Lord. It's another one of Mark's ways of saying that Jesus is God. He just does it in such brilliant little ways that you never really think about. You know, that's why I say Mark is a brilliant theologian. He really is. So he tells them to sit down on the green grass. That's why he has green grass. I'm really convinced of it. I remember one time I was doing this for a group of campus ministers, and there were some college students who were helping out one year. And the following year, they uh, were helping out again, and I showed up to give the talk, and they said, Are you talking about green grass? <laughs> I said, Yes. <laughs> I obviously hit on the nerve with the green grass. But then when they sit down on the green grass, they take their places in rows of hundreds and fifties. And again, in the translation, the Greek is prosiae, prosiae, whatever that means. But the New American translates it neatly arranged like flower beds. <laughs> all, all, I, all I can imagine is these people looking like the gardens of Versailles. <laughs> I'm not quite. I think it simply means they sat orderly. You know, not rather than neatly arranged like flower beds. <laughs> then Jesus takes the five loaves, looks up to heaven, blesses, breaks, and gives to the disciples to give to the people. Looked up, blessed, broke, gave. Those four verbs will appear again later on in the Gospel at the Last Supper, the context of the institution of the Eucharist. And so we have an overtone here, not only of Jesus feeding the people as shepherd who is Lord, but it's prefiguring how he will feed the people with his body as shepherd, as Lord. Again, just so many different things, so many different things that tie together in this gospel. <laughs> And they ate and were satisfied and picked up 12 wicker baskets full of fragments. I can imagine, you know, that young kid's mother, when he got home, here he took off five loaves and two fish and he comes back with 12 baskets of food. <laughs> Those who ate were 5,000 men. Matthew says not counting women and children. And so, you know, there was a significant miracle there. I'm not going to go into the... Uh, problematics with people in terms of whether this was a miracle or not. I claim it was a miracle. We'll leave it there. Now we get to the central section. This may be all we'll get to deal with since we're getting toward the end of time here. In chapter 8, the central